All right. It's 1132. Hello, everyone, and welcome. If you're, uh, if you're just funneling in, welcome to the Thursday process. Uh, appreciate you taking some time out of your day to join Emily and I as we talk about remote workforce culture and, and really developing a healthy workforce culture. So we're going to go ahead and get started. One thing that we always do on this webinar series is I do read this disclaimer, and that's based off of advice of my counsel. Uh, presentations that we do on the Thursday process are intended for educational purposes only. This should not replace your independent judgment, your own personal judgment, independent professional advice, anything of that nature. Facts and opinions expressed here are the participants individually. Don't take this as representing the opinion or the position of, of employers, certifying bodies, etc. Nothing in these presentations should be considered legal or financial or any other sort of professional advice. You might be watching this on demand. Today is September 29th, 2022 at 1130 Eastern. Uh, and we are not updating this afterwards. So if you're viewing this on demand at a later date, please note that the content hasn't been updated uh, after today. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. There's going to be polls that pop up. You'll see them pop up on your screen. We do appreciate your participation in the polls. Those polls aren't sent off to places or anything. We use those to help us figure out what content we need to present next on this webinar series. So if you don't mind answering those polls, that's really useful for us so that we can know who you are, what's, what's, what you're interested in, and what we should be doing next. There's a, a chat um, Q&A panel up in the upper right-hand corner. Two things on there. The handout section is where you'll find the process we're referring to today. It's a PDF. Go ahead and download that. You can follow along. We are skipping up and down throughout it, but that's yours to keep. And if you have questions, throw them out in the Q&A section. Um, we will answer those live as we go through, but there's also a, a small amount of time reserved near the bottom of the hour for us to uh, hand handle any remaining questions and answers. Uh, everyone's on mute today, so if you talk, we won't hear you. And so um, some introductions. As, as I mentioned before, I'm Ian Richardson. I'm one half of the Richardsons. Carrie and I form up Richardson and Richardson Consulting. We're a uh, a business consultancy uh, in the IT space. We help out with marketing and process strategy planning. And I'm joined today by Emily Glass, CEO of Synchro. Emily, how are you doing today? I was trying to find the unmute button. It got covered by the poll. <laughs> oh, there you go. But... I am doing well. Thank you for having me, and it's great to be here today. Oh, it's, it's, it's my pleasure and privilege. I really appreciate you taking some time. A little background on Emily. She's the CEO of the president and CEO of Synchro. Synchro, for those who aren't aware, is an all-in-one RMM, PSA, and remote access tool. It helps managed service providers run more profitable businesses. Before joining Synchro, she was customer experience officer at Data, where she created an award-winning technical support experience as well as Data's Chief Product Officer, Driving Product Strategy. She's also served in senior leadership positions at Alice, Backupify, Akamai, and Brightcove. She's got degrees in both engineering and fine arts. And speaking as someone who spent a lot of time with Emily over the past month, she's awesome. So I'm a huge, huge fan, and uh, I can't wait to dive into this topic. And Thank you for the endorsement and rundown. Yeah, oh. sounds, like, sounds like a lot. <laughs> well, see, that's share. it's it's amazing when we look back in the mirror when we go, oh, hey, I I did some things, I did some things. There's some, yeah, in some places. There's some meat there. So the challenge is Synchro is an interesting case study in this. So Synchro had a, a background where there were two companies that that merged, mm -hmm. and those two companies had two different physical presences, diverse workforces, distributed workforces. And Emily, this I know this predates you joining the team, but can you give us just a little bit of a background on what was going on that caused us to say, hey, maybe we should pursue a remote, a remote only workforce strategy? Yeah, great question. So as you mentioned, yeah, two teams came together, two companies came together, but teams in different locations, both in the US and both in the same time zone. So a little bit less complex than otherwise might be. 
uh, but still, you know, far enough away. They tried to make it work, tried to sort of meet up and drive and uh, make that a frequent occurrence. But over time, that kind of fell apart. And I think part, part naturally they realized, hey, maybe we should really just choose the remote workforce path to make this easier on ourselves. So we don't feel like we're constantly failing at getting together, right? Mm -hmm. Let's choose, choose a, a way of working together that we can actually feel successful in. Um, and then I think the second reason or motivation was that Synchro has always been a company where it's, you know, the people first, uh, it's, cult, it's very, uh, uh, our, we, our culture is really important to us. Um, and we want to do things that make sense for our partners and for the, for our employees. And so we're willing to try new things. So at the time when they made the decision, this is back in 2017, 100% remote was a little bit of a, a newer concept. It still, still is today to some degree. Uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. I think, but, but our culture and our, our desire to sort of innovate and try new things led us to s explore that option more fully. So that's kind of what led us uh, to, to having the hundred percent remote workforce. Man, and it's, um, Synchro I think is almost, uh, a little bit, uh, there's a little bit of like, wow, that was, that was an amazing unintentional foresight because then fast forward a couple of years and the world is hit by COVID-19 and everyone's forced to go at least partially remote for a period of time. And, and many people have, have kept that remote workforce or a hybrid environment. And, and you guys pivoted at that point to saying, hey, like we're remote, we're primary remote and we're supplementing with face-to-face -to, -face to, nope, we're remote all the time and we're gonna find a way to convert those face-to-face -face activities. And, and as you guys have exploded in growth, we're not in the same time zone anymore. We're mm. not in the same country anymore. We've got a diverse global workforce. Yeah, I thought you were gonna say we're not in Kansas anymore. No, <laughs> yeah, no. And, and growth is a main challenge. Uh, yes, we've grown by dimensions, time zones and countries, and, uh, but also added a ton of people to the team and the complexity of the product and our partner base has grown. So all of the growth that we've seen sort of stretch the limits too. even if we were comfortably operating remote before the pandemic supplemented by in-person, having the in-person taken away and then also experiencing high growth at the same mm -hmm. time adds, uh, you know, different uh, pressures to the system that was working good. Uh, we need to make sure it continues to work well. Yeah. So there were some decisions that, that, that Team Synchro made. We, there, was, there was that decision to, hey, we're going to double down on remote. We're going to invest in this strategy. There's kind of that intentional focus on, uh, on making sure that we've got communication alongside inclusion trying to in trying to take a an abstract concept like culture or a, a like one of those above the line this is more feelings and and subjective versus objective and then say hey how can we make some data informed decisions around this mm -hmm. and having a alignment vision and core values be be a focus so walk us through some of these decisions and and how you how you came up with the strategy around remote workforce yeah, and again, you know, I wasn't here um, even yep. at the start of the pandemic, so I'm I'm picking this up in the in the last year and sort of improving upon it. So I'm not going to take credit for everything, all the foundation that was already here that was working well. Um, but I have been a big part of sort of making it continue to scale, and it's a con and continuous effort, right? We're never we're never done. There's always mm -hmm. something new that's going to break, uh, some new growth path, something some new challenge to uh, address and overcome. So it's a continuous process. Um, I think, you know, we wanted to make sure that we put our people first. And so through the pandemic, there was a lot of stress. Um, and so we wanted to make it as easy as possible, as flexible, and be as flexible as possible um, so that they can continue to contribute and, and work productively at Synchro, but also take care of other things, uh, you know, that were going on. And keep in mind that, yes, it was the pandemic, but it was also a really uh, tough talent market over the last few years Pr prior to earlier this year it was a really tough talent market so being remote and really focusing on how we could ramp people up and have them be successful in that environment and understand how to contribute to saying grow in that environment was key to allowing us to continue to grow and attract the talent that we needed to fuel our business as well so it was on, it was a strategic priority to make sure that this mode of operation really was working well yeah and, and so Two things that really resonated out that I wanted to highlight is one, you had mentioned 
hey, I, I came in after this strategy and been executed and I picked it up and, and keep going. And that's really that um, for my spot in the sandbox, that really defines a process. A process is, is when we can kind of come in and a role, a strategy, a tactic, whatever can migrate from one person's desk to another person's desk successfully. Sure, there might be a little bump in the road or whatever, but it's like, hey, this new person's coming in and leading the charge, leading the team, leading the company. And there's a process in place. And those that that system, that documentation plus actions plus accountability lets us transfer mm -hmm. responsibility easily. So that's just like having you articulate that, that really drives home this is the process that Synchro uses, folks, that, that, that this is what has created success because it has allowed all the way at the top, the chief executive officer to swap midstream and it works. Yeah, um, it, it can be done. And I think that comes down to some of the things you have on this slide but the and that you just mentioned, the two main elements of that, that, that smooth handoff right, for me, and whether it's a new employee, whether it was myself coming in, whatever the, the change that's happening, really comes down to like, have you articulated your core values? Um, and do people, you know, have a shared sense of what those are? Because that drives a lot of decision making, how we prioritize work, what we're all here for, that kind of thing, right? So it gives you a good foundation to operate from and handle and digest change. Um, and then the second big piece was just having an operating cadence that people understand and that works for them. So they're getting the information they need about changes um, mm -hmm. or about new, new introductions. So we had a very good uh, operating cadence, like set of meetings, when we communicated that, you know, how we communicate information that was set up before I joined that I think facilitated that smooth handoff. Well, and so one of the... Um... One of the mentions that, that, you, that you're talking about, there's some, some operating cadence, et cetera. There's other infrastructure that needed to, that needed to come in. The um, making sure to, you, when you and I spoke, there's a huge concept about remote workforce. How are we gonna not only manage documents, but be able to collaborate? We've got three people, they all gotta work in the same whatever. Mm -hmm. How can we enable collaboration? And then another key piece um, and I, I'd like to spend a little time on here is teams and then also um, like, like being able to connect teams through a chat program. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of wind, wind up that talk track on, uh, and, and you have, you have such a great, such a great story around this about how often and how we communicate with people. So, so talk to us about some of the infrastructure challenges and the way that you guys have tackled those. Yeah, um, uh, for sure, I can share. So, you know, have, the first bullet on this slide, having solid data and then alignment is really key. So you can have a lot of data in a lot of disparate systems mm -hmm. that groups look at in an isolated fashion and draw their own conclusions. Uh, that's, that's, that's good, but like, that's a start. That's data, that's uh, isolated, isolated insights. But I think the real power there comes from having sort of uh, shared understanding about mm -hmm. what the data is telling us, what that story is, and then what we're gonna do about it or, or not, you know, or do nothing about it uh, as the case may be. So mm -hmm. really understanding the source of truth, what, what is the correct data? Everybody agreeing that that is a reflection of reality, right? Cause that often happens too. It's like, oh, that, that is an eight, but I don't agree that it should, you know, I think it should be 10. No, no, oh, no, yeah. right, <laughs> like, whatever it is. So having a shared understanding and buy-in to that, you know, we're looking at the right pieces of data and then what are the conclusions we're coming to as a result of reflecting on that cross teams, not just in my own bubble, not just in my own head, right? And going off and doing something that people don't understand, has no context, really sharing with the business as much as we can about like, here's what we saw, here were the indicators, here's the underlying data, therefore, this is what we're gonna do about it. And we, we can disagree, we can debate, we can, you know, whatever, we can maybe change our minds if someone has a new perspective. But I think that's really key. Having those conversations is really important to keep people aligned. Um, and it's a really um, big part of the infrastructure. And then I think, you know, you mentioned documentation sharing, um, chat programs. We are heavy, heavy Slack uh, users. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's probably pretty typical of a remote uh, workforce. Uh, email is, you know, the oh, yeah. 
<laughs> and, antiquated at this point. It's it's like yeah. sending a letter through USPS. <laughs> yes, I get I get vendors and spam through email. It's pretty much all my email is for. Um, and everything else happens in Slack. We even have partners in our Slack mm -hmm. channel. We have you know vendor partners. Our our own customers are in Slack. So our whole world sort of revolves in Slack. It's documented, right? It's an archive for someone who might be in a different time zone to look up. It's really critical to have have those conversations there for everyone to read and participate in um, at their own sort of pace. And so that's um, there were there were a couple of things on there that uh, that I want to highlight. One of the areas that I found um, it, it differentiated Synchro as an organization to me is that when you guys come to a conclusion, when you're analyzing that data, and and you you touched on this, but I wanted to highlight that you pull all that together, you put it into a, into a digestible medium. Obviously, if there's something highly confidential, like some HR reports or whatever, those, those might be, you know, the, the, obviously with a, with a level head on sharing, but whenever possible, the default stance of Synchro is present all of that back to everyone. Mm -hmm. So from the, the brand new support engineer all the way up through the executive suite, it's, hey, this is our data. This is how we've interpreted it. This is what we're thinking, and everyone's allowed to to communicate back and mm -hmm. and share that broad perspective. And that you you had mentioned to me that that is a key piece of how you and your leadership make decisions is you first share that data so that you can get that extra perspective because someone in the support team or the dev team or the sales team or the finance team is going to have a different viewpoint, and that makes a better, ro more robust plan. Yeah, even leaders, you know, even leaders cross-functionally have a particular view on mm -hmm. what they think might be happening in their organizations or what they think a particular day-to-day -day process might look like. So it really is important to share it to all levels. And this is one of the main challenges we've had over the last year too. And, 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 and I, I think it's not uncommon is that sharing data could be scary for mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of leaders especially um, because it can be interpreted in different ways. So in order to have an environment where it actually is productive to share the data and you get sort of mm -hmm. good conversation versus scary and uh, promotes fear or you know pro problematic conversations or interpretations, you really need to educate when you're going to show data. So we try as much as possible because mm -hmm. we have a lot of people. This is their first job. We're a startup. You know, we're 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 just getting going. Um, not everything's always great. You know, sometimes there's ba bad data, oh, yeah. there's bad things happening. So giving people context um, and really talking about a benchmark um, or educating, like, what does this mean? Um, when, when, you know, depending on the level that we're presenting the data to can really help them understand and not overreact or be afraid of what they might be seeing um, in the data. Yeah, the, the data without context, um, I love that, that it can create fear. That's such a, an important thing to say. And, and almost there's, um, when, when, when Carrie, when Carrie and I are having, having discussions about Richardson and Richardson, one of the areas that we really do is we say, Hey, like, let's create space for feelings. And if there's a talk track or a strategy or something being discussed and one of us says, yeah, okay, like I need to, I've got a feeling that's kind of coming up, like letting that get aired almost takes it takes the, the hot air out of the balloon right like that feeling kind of bubbles up and it can crowd out any sort of ability to process so when someone says hey I, I feel anxious by this data i feel afraid by this data i'm nervous about this okay well you're nervous tell us more about that and yeah. then it like suddenly just because we were able to give name to that it makes it able to be overcome yeah it diffuses so, it and it can actually yeah. leave more insights right? Mm -hmm. um, again, you can never foresee how someone else is going to interpret data. In this case, this is what we're talking about. And so um, having that conversation, allowing the space for someone to tell you, to give you the feedback or to respond and say, here's how I'm interpreted, interpreting this, or here are the questions that are coming up for me when I look at this, or when you're telling me this is mm -hmm. as important as the first step of communicating in the first place, right? Because we can't foresee, you know, what how someone's going to interpret what we're saying with the data. We might think, oh, this is no big deal, uh, but for them, you know, they they see it a different way. It might impact their workflow greatly, or their their day to day, or maybe even their job. They might interpret it that way. So, understanding how they're interpreting it is really important. 
sorry. Okay. Just uh, I was uh, just waving at uh, just waving at someone making a bunch of noise in the background. Yes. <laughs> the joys of remote work, everyone. I didn't hear. I didn't hear it very much though, so you're you're good. Okay. <laughs> um, the other the other big key uh, the other big key um, piece on that, and and we had a, a a good discussion. There's that adage of hey, you have to say something seven times or or in multiple ways for someone to grab this you guys have had some pretty unique experiences around the need to consider learning types and preferred method of communication and even time zone when you're presenting information and data talk to us about that yeah that that's a great point i mean um, yeah, the old adage is like, you know, you have to say a good seven good things to count, counterbalance like the one bad thing. Um, mm-hmm. there's an adage about like how many times you have to repeat something before people actually kind of hear it. So yeah, we do try to echo messages again and again. As a leader, it seems very repetitive uh, because you're the, the one delivering it, you know, five, 10, 15, whatever in different formats and, and uh, occasions. But, you know, I, I try to remember that this might be the other person's first time hearing this. Yes, it's old hat to me. I've said it, you know, 20 times, mm-hmm. but they might be hearing it for the first time. And then the multiple mediums, I have a great story about that quick one. Um, we went to an exec offsite recently and we, um, I had a presentation. I was telling them about the state of the business. So mm-hmm. the data to me is internalized. Like I live, sleep, breathe, breathe this data. <laughs> so I'm like, so our growth is this, our turn is that, or this, you know, I'm just rattling it off. And to me, it tells a complete story. I'm like, so therefore, you know, this is a priority and this is not, and here's what I conclude. And they're like all nodding, yes, yes, yes. I'm like, okay, good, they get it. And then the next day, um, we had the same data presented, but in charts. So a different person presented the exact oh. same presented in a chart. And it, this went on for like hours with questions and like, I don't understand that thing. And I'm like, I said, <laughs> I said this exact same thing yesterday, like the same numbers, nothing to and yet no engagement, not real understanding of what story or narrative um, mm-hmm. or therefore actions were required simply because of the format. And you know, this is not a new lesson either, but um, these are people who deal with the data all the time the same way I did, and they needed to see it in a different way to engage with it and for it to be accessible um, and to like interpret, right? Trend lines where in mm-hmm. my brain, it was obvious. I just needed numbers. They needed the chart. Um, so it was just a great reminder that, you know, you think it's, it's commonplace and it's de facto and everybody gets it, but really, um, really they don't. And silence might be a good cue that really they're not, um, they're not understanding or not, uh, feeling like it's accessible. Yeah. That, that measurement of, Hey, how many, how many questions are we getting? How much engagement are we getting? Can, uh, can, can trigger a, Hey, that like. I'm wondering about comprehension here. I'm wondering about like, is is this just blowing by? Is it going in one ear and out the other? And so at Synchro, you and your your team have a methodology of, of, hey, we've got to do this. We might send it out via email or chat. We might also write it down. It might have an internal social post. It might have a video. It might have an infographic. Like there's just a, a huge commitment to how many different ways can we present this same data so that we're certain everybody has a chance to to not only see it, but ruminate on it, comprehend it, and then give their perspective or concerns or questions back about it. Yeah, and I still think we have room for improvement there, right? I still Mm -hmm. think we probably could do it even more to reach everybody. Um, And then then you were talking about time zones too, and I have one tip here uh, that I think about a lot because I had a friend who was going to participate in a graduation ceremony and she had a broken her foot. Mm-hmm. And so she was wondering, how am I going to do this? How many, so she went to the site, she had to see other stairs. Do, how am I going to be able to get from here to here? She had to like walk the path with new mm-hmm. eyes. This is the thing, she was a professor. So this is a thing she did every year. But now that she had a broken foot, it was like a whole new world. Mm-hmm. Um, and she had to go map it. So for the time zone, I try to take that lesson and I try to work different time zones and see what it feels like. What meetings am I going to miss? What communications or whole threads of Slack do I wake up to or come back to uh, that I may have wanted to opine on? And what's that experience like? 
for someone who might not be in my time zone or like our dominant time zone where we have the majority of our employees. And that can give you some great clues as to where, you know, you might be excluding people from the conversation or not reaching folks with your message. And then that uh, when you have that sort of experiential knowledge, you can then either create a secondary opportunity to engage or modify. So, hey, instead of 8 a.m. Eastern, guys, we're going to hold these meetings at 5 p.m. because it lets people in a different area participate a bit better. Yeah, or alternate. Mm -hmm. So different folks are inconvenienced. <laughs> so it's not yep. always the same group that uh, has to wake up early or stay up late. Yeah. Yep. And flip it, flip it back and forth. Yeah. So diving into the process, um, there's a few different things here. And if if folks, if it looks like I'm reading something, it's because I absolutely am. I'm uh, I'm over onto our process doc. And so there's a there's a couple of key sections. I wanted to to talk with you through Emily. And so one of them is hiring and onboarding team members. Mm -hmm. And we had, a, we had a really good discussion around, hey, there, there's a, a balance around, I need to have stuff documented. I need to have that documentation created and keeping that documentation current. And it kind of, it, it, it sways like a seesaw. And, and so you have a, a strategic focus around the first 90 days. Talk to us, talk to us about that. Yes, I think as anybody um, who knows who's written documentation or been responsible for a knowledge base or an FAQ or any, any intranet ever mm -hmm. uh, knows that uh, the value of the documentation is in its usefulness, right? And in its cur currency, like, is it up to date? Is it, is it actually accurate? Um, which requires, like you said, an investment to maintain it. Um, and so I've done this a few times for, for customers, for internal purposes. And I've kind of developed this mantra that like, decide what the doc documentation is for, who's gonna use this, and then try to design the maintenance to be as light as possible. And the more you can sort of narrow the purpose, the easier it is to kind of like maintain it in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for, for us, we, we, didn't we didn't have a ton of documentation going into this year, or we were trying to invest more. And we wanted to have an intranet for the first time. So this was end of last year. Uh, and we wanted to document every, you know, everybody wants to document everything. Oh, we yeah. All the things. And I'm like, oh, gosh, think of all the things that you maintain. That sounds horrible. Um, so I said, look, guys, let's let's pick like why what's the driving need? Why do we feel like we don't have enough documentation? Where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. And after we talked about it, we realized it was a pain point with new hires. We wanted to, them to have the answers to all their questions. And really, a lot of the questions ar ar arose from folks in the first 90 days, because after 90 days, you know somebody you can go ask. But yep. in the first 90 days, you don't, maybe. Um, and, and you don't want to ask, and you're scared, and all these things. So I said, let's focus on the first 90 days of employment, and let's get everything together that we feel is pertinent to that. Um, and that's where we're going to focus our effort on documentation. And that's what we did. Um, and I think it's gone pretty well, actually. <laughs> so, so that really helped narrowing the focus. It's for new hires getting settled in the first 90 days. What are the common questions and um, information they're going to need uh, to be successful? I love that. Uh, I love that focus of the documentation. Almost, what's what's the purpose of writing this down? What do we want to What do we want to achieve? Yeah. And then another big another big topic that we talked around that accountability and alignment. And there are two big best practices, and, and so we'll tackle them one at a time, um, two huge best practices that Synchro has. And one we've been talking about quite a bit, so we'll start with that, is data and reports. And mm -hmm. that, um, that dashboard, the, the sharing of the trends, the, the multiple viewpoints. The second one mm -hmm. is a really, powerful, a really powerful topic, and I don't want to. I don't want to take the wind out of the sails. So I'm just going to say what it is, and you know what it is, and I'll let you. I'll let you take it there. But talk to us about anonymous questions. Okay, so I won't take any credit for this. I did not invent this topic. Um, people use anonymous surveys all the time, right? So I don't have a, a copyright on this. And in fact, it was a former boss that introduced me to this concept much to my like strong resistance to begin with. I really hated this. Um, so I'll describe it and then I'll tell you how I overcame my hatred uh, or my dislike for this. So basically every, I have an open survey, it's anonymous. It doesn't track your IP address, your email, it doesn't track anything. I have no idea who's submitting things. It's internal only though. 
Um, and so anyone at any time, it's always open, can submit a question that gets answered by me. And what's nice about it is since it's anonymous, I have to respond to the entire company, right? I can't, because I don't, uh, otherwise yep. I don't get the answer out. So I check in about once a week, I see how many questions I've gotten, and then I, I publish a, a CEO update every week, and then I answer the anonymous questions uh, threaded with my update. Um, so anything that I get, um, everybody in the company has access to the question and the answer. Um, and why I hated this as a leader <laughs> when I first was forced to do it was that, you know, people don't always ask the most polite questions, and mm -hmm. they definitely don't ask the easiest questions. And um, in my righteous leadership uh, position, I thought, you know, why, you know, if we really have such a welcoming open culture, why do people really need anonymity to ask a question? Isn't this the opposite of what we're trying to do here and having, having this open culture? Doesn't this tell people that, like, you should be afraid to ask a question if you need to be anonymous to ask it? And that was my moral high ground and my reason for, for kind of resisting. But over time, as I was forced to conform and do it, I came to see actually, I came to see it from a different lens, which is that one, it really holds leaders accountable. Um, it really, after, after having gone through the, the motions a few times, right, getting questions about difficult decisions I had made, mm -hmm. um, it gave me the foresight to think about what questions am I going to get when I make this decision and prefetch kind of answering them and actually factor them into the decision to start with, right? Which I think made me make better decisions as a leader, knowing mm -hmm. that I was gonna have to explain why to anybody who had any flavor of question uh, that they wanted to ask me. Um, and I think, you know, having to have that accountability in front of not just the person impacted by the decision or the team impacted, um, knowing that I have to tell the whole company why I did this thing, just made, like, yeah, like I said, made me make better decisions as a leader, for sure. And I also, on the, on the topic of anonymity, I got over this notion, um, it comes up again and again, every time I implement this at a company, people resist because they're like, well, you don't really have to be anonymous here. What are, you, what are you saying about our culture? And I tell them that, you know, you never know. This could be a new hire who doesn't mm -hmm. feel comfortable, doesn't know what's appropriate to ask, could be someone who, you know, despite your every best intention to assure them that like there's no repercussion and there's no risk and we're open, still has a, um, a prior experience in their lives that causes them to feel nervous about asking a question. So it's really the only way that you can guarantee you are going to get cast the widest net and get any question asked. It's the only way I've found. And so I'll do it despite, you know, shortcomings that people might perceive. Well, and then that... Um especially in that is coming from so my background for those who aren't aware before I, I Carrie and I founded Richardson Richardson I owned an MSP for 16 years and a lot of the times we have to be the quote unquote smartest people in the room but the, you know a doctor doesn't know anything about IT mm -hmm. a, a lawyer doesn't know anything about IT and so we're expected to know everything and it's really really scary for a long time to be willing and able to take the vulnerable state of, I have no idea. I don't know the answer to that question. It doesn't mean you can't find out. It doesn't mean that you can't come up with an answer, but hey, I've got this question. I don't know. And these days I find myself, that is my normal, that is almost my default reply. Even if I do know, I might say, I don't know. What do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because that, that solicitation of feedback is so valuable. So I, I love the permission to allow someone to say, well, hey, I don't know this, but I don't have to necessarily worry about the shame, fear, doubt, et cetera, of admitting that I don't know. Mm -hmm. The other piece that really resonated with me when we talked about this and you shared that is in, the, in a leadership role, as, as for those of you who are on the call, if you own your company, if you're a partner in your company or a CEO or leader in your company, how can your team hold you accountable? is a really great question to, to ruminate on. And whether you're remote or face-to-face -face or hybrid or whatever it might be, this anonymous questions, and, and Emily, you, you nailed down the head, it allows everyone in the company to have a sense of accountability back to the C-suite, which due to the nature of, of your position, that's pretty hard to hold you accountable if, if my name isn't found, followed by founder or shareholder or owner of the company that's pretty tough for for someone to do 
Yeah. Yeah. So. And it's a pretty vulnerable position for a leader themselves to be in. Like, yes, we have a title. So there's, you know, some security there, but I don't, I don't like to rest on that. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I, I'm not afraid to say, like you were saying, you know, I don't know is an answer. Sometimes someone makes a point in these questions and I'm like, oh crap, you know, you're right. That, I didn't think about that. I'm so sorry. You know, like I didn't think about that perspective or I didn't think about that team or I didn't prioritize that. And you're right. I, vo I violated one of our core values or this aspect, but let me explain why. Um, and it, and then, you know, it might evolve to this deeper understanding and context for that person about why that decision was made too. Um, mm -hmm. Or it might lead to a better decision on my part next time. So win-win. Yeah. Every, everybody, everybody wins, nobody loses by accountability and organization. Yeah. And so there's um, a couple on management of, of culture. There's a few different things in these management tips and tricks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, again, that using that data, which, which there's different KPIs. And, and if you dive into the, into the document, uh, folks on the call, you'll see some of those. But there were a couple of techniques that, were really, that really, really bubbled up and, and resonated. And so one... Being remote, you'd already you've already mentioned this, Emily. That focus on chat, that that immediacy, communications, intentional. But there's a couple of things that Synchro does to duplicate or or try to duplicate as much as possible the office environment. That mm -hmm. ability to have a chat at someone's desk or at the water cooler. Talk us through some of the some of the intentional things that that you and your team do to make it feel more like a, a team instead of a, hey, I'm, I'm working in my bubble. Yeah, and that's really the danger. You've highlighted the danger of remote work. One of the dangers of remote work, which is that, you know, we log in and we do just work, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people feel that the, the lack of connection um, uh, uh, grows over time, right? I'm not connecting to other people. I don't know what my purpose is here. I don't know how I'm contributing to the purpose because all I do is come and I do my slacks and I, you know, answer tickets or I, you know, code some stuff. And it's just like a tunnel vision on the work aspect, not the connection to, of my work um, to like, you know, my purpose or to the company's purpose. And to do that, that's where I think like the water cooler, the grab a coffee, the the playing ping pong, whatever, uh, all the informal activities or interactions that come in a workplace, you have to work intentionally to create those opportunities in a virtual environment. Um, and sometimes people are just tired and they don't want to be on another Zoom call and another, another you know, uh, chat message. But we do do a few things that I think help enable those informal connections. So one, um, and it's in the doc, you know, for people to have to look at is, you know, we do have personal interest channels, so different hobbies, different sports teams, you know, anything that encourages that personal connection for folks, we, we have channels around that. Um, and then we also have affinity groups, uh, which again goes to sort of the purpose in life uh, and mm -hmm. connecting to some of the social causes or other topics that you might want to discuss and letting people find each other that have had common experiences or that want to talk about common challenges or topics, um, find each other and have those conversations, even though they don't relate to the bottom line of the business necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it really allows people to connect and feel like they're part of something greater than, you know, what they do transactionally every day. Um, and I think that's really, really important. One, one last thing I'll just highlight um, before I move, before you ask the next question or you move <laughs> along is um, team meetings. So we mm -hmm. do do virtual sort of town halls or all hands, people have different names. We call it team day. Uh, we do it every week. And I've done this monthly, quarterly, weekly at different companies and, and different um, you know, stages of company. We're, weekly is working for us now, might change in the future. Uh, but because we're growing so quickly, because the world is changing so quickly, uh, we have enough content and things to communicate on a weekly basis that it makes sense to meet. And so we communicate formal things, formal is my word for like business related mm -hmm. things, information changes. Um, but then we always reserve some time for informal connection. So we have a question of the day where we do breakout rooms, or we have a lightning talk where someone talks about something in their life could be work related. Like I learned a new programming language. Let me tell you about it. Or it could be, I went uh, on this cool trip to Italy. Let me show you all the food I ate and make your mouth water. Um, oh, I love that. The, the food feed. <laughs> Yeah. So we do find ways for people to, you know, 
remember that we're individuals here. We're not robots. Uh, we're mm -hmm. not, you know, just behind a screen. We have personalities and desires and things we do in our lives outside of work, um, which helps to foster that that connection and that purpose. A quick question that, that came in from the audience. Kim had asked, uh, what platform do you use for the anonymous mm -hmm. questions? Do you mind sharing that? I don't. Um, so you know what? It's it's a, a very simple form. So I actually use Google Forms to do it, but you can use anything um, because all that you need to do is say, I put a, a disclaimer up. I have a little blurb that says, you know, you don't need to be anonymous. You can name yourself if you want, but if you don't, that's totally fine. Ask me a question. I answer them weekly and then you give a text box and that's it. So any survey tool of choice that allows you to make it anonymous is totally fine. I use Google Forms. All right, I'm throwing that into the uh, into Great. the answered section as well. So um, one thing that I that I that we had a um, a conversation around is feedback, and so there is um, there is a couple of things around anonymous questions. And so if you're following on the, along in the doc, if you scroll down to the metrics for success, one of the things that you're using around feedback is tone. What's mm -hmm. the tone of the questions? How many questions? Is there a dip? Is there a raise? Um, that that kind of creates a, a feedback loop for you that even though, hey, it's it's an anonymous question or whatever, you're looking at the trends around those questions to see is there something abnormal happening, an increase, a decrease, a, a change in tone. Um, yeah. And another and one. Is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go go. Well, I was going to say some of that is feel you'll get over time. And I hate when the answer is like it's subjective or, you know, it depends. Uh, but, you know, as you do, as you get comfortable with anonymous questions over time, um, you can start to infer like how the business is feeling. It becomes like a, a barometer for how are maybe it, how is a team feeling, right? You might get a ton of support support related questions let me for engineer like you know even if they don't identify themselves you can kind of tell you know what what group mm -hmm. or area came from or maybe a decision that was made that's just not popular no matter what department you know um so it really kind of gives you an idea of especially remotely when you can't check in with people informally a good informal check of like how are people feeling about the decisions that i have made or we've made as an exec team where the company's going what are they worried about just from the topic of the questions, right? Um, so yeah, it's really helpful to just monitor. Are you are you getting any anonymous questions? Mm -hmm. If it comes to quiet, what does that what does that mean, right? Or yeah, how are people feeling? So uh, it could be an indicator that I might need to go have more open office hours and like find out if it's getting quiet, that kind of thing. And a, another one um, that that goes hand in hand is with all new hires. You have a key. It, uh, it's I call them magic questions. You have the magic question of, hey, why did you choose to join Synchro? Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned that if culture isn't the number one answer or right there, yeah. that's a that's a that's a bellwether. That's a that's a that's a warning bell, a big red flag. A hundred percent because when I joined, uh, I noticed it was number one. So it might not be, maybe, maybe your business is different and you have a different number one question and that's what you want to embrace. So I'm not saying it has to be, um, you know, culture, but for Synchro, it was culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to, I wanted to monitor what the answers were to know if that was changing. Maybe it would be good, right? Maybe that change would be acceptable. In this case, I wanted to make sure it was staying culture. And so, yeah, I do a CEO welcome with every new hire class. And I always ask each individual, why did you join Synchro? How did you hear about us? You know what were your expectations coming in? Why, why are you here? Uh, and, and culture is sort of the predominant answer and continues to be, but that would be a, a good, um, again, signifier that something might be changing um, that I could look into and see, is that desirable or not? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things, uh, one of the key pieces, and, and this was, um, this was a big, this is one of my, one of my big takeaways from our conversation is empathy around the experience. And so talk to us about this because you had, you had some amazing insight into, hey, remote culture is just fundamentally different than when yeah. you're face to face. Can you, can you talk us through some of that, some of that, some of those uh, yeah. key notes around a remote, a remote experience for people? Absolutely. And I think it starts with um, the fact that I think a lot of folks, especially 
uh, uh, companies that haven't been operating remote for a while or you know, just started with the pandemic. Um, I see a lot of, of uh, discussion online and in forums about like, how do we get people back to the office or how do we get back to what we were doing? Um, and this, uh, this fundamental sort of lack of curiosity for like, well, could it be better? Could it, what would it look like if we went mm -hmm. uh, remote, um, remote only or remote first? Um, and I think, I don't think it's possible to go back because I think so much has changed in the world and people's lives that it's kind of nearly impossible, right? Uh, so I think the amount of energy people are dedicating to like, can we go back? If they just put that amount of energy to like, can we go forward? Um, you know, they might they might get there faster, but it's okay. Uh, so so yeah, having empathy, I think um, uh, when you're remote, people are at home, right? I mean, maybe they're in a, a co-working space, but most of them are at home. So their lives are, you know, uh, deeply intertwined with their work lives, right? Their dogs in the background, their kids screaming, the lunches is beeping in the microwave, whatever, the news is on and some okay. things happening. Uh, these things are unavoidable. And we we've had this discussion at Synchro where it's like, well, you know, some people feel like, well, those social issues or those personal issues, you know, people go to work to forget those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just fundamentally don't agree with that position. I think that who you are, what you're dealing with outside of work has like a ton of impact about how you show up in the workplace, how you view change, your capacity to handle stress at work or, mm -hmm. you know, celebrate wins. Um, it's impossible to divide ourselves. I know we tried to, we tried to do that and kid ourselves in the past and that was possible. I just don't think in today's day and age that it's possible to divide ourselves like that anymore, especially not in a remote uh, workplace, which then extends to not only having empathy for the person, but having empathy for what's going on in the world and social issues. And what place does that have for discussion in the workplace and how do we get comfortable having those conversations, which might be pretty um, controversial, polarizing, um, and and like, how do you bring you know different political beliefs together, and and yet come out with a coherent sort of culture? It's very very challenging, but I think it's inevitable. Well, and there's um, even just keeping in mind what is going on in this person's world. So, uh, in in a remote culture, if any of you have any team members or customers remotely near Florida you understand what's going on right now because there is a hurricane named after me and I fit like <laughs> I speak on behalf of all Ian's that storm's a jerk yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh but there there's hurricane Ian is blowing through Florida right now and that if you've got a distributed workforce you might have some or a majority of your team if there's a significant Florida presence who's out of action yeah, and, and you have to, but it doesn't have to be a hurricane. It could just be a, hey, someone's like down the road doing some construction on a house or there's a lawnmower going next door in the neighbor, you know, the neighbor's yard that's kind of buzzing in the background and saying like, okay, well, like that's, that's what we get. Can't go out and yell at the neighbor. Hey, stop mowing your lawn. I'm on a Zoom call. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's just a greater example of context. You know, we talked about context for data. At the, at the beginning of, of, the, of the show. And now we're coming sort of back to context, which is that, you know, you can't really separate someone's life context, uh, weather context from their work environment anymore. Um, it's just not possible. And so you need to think about how are you supporting individuals through that? How are you keeping on top of all of that? So you don't, you know, forget about it. Um, and there's so many things happening in the world today. I see, I have lots of data like NPS scores, ENPS mm -hmm. scores, types of things people are struggling with that show that like, at least in our partner base and our employee base, it's not a great time for folks, right? This is not a stress-free, uh, you know, existence mm -hmm. right now. There's a lot of different things happening and a lot of change happening and people are stressed out. Um, and so how can we make Synchro um, a supportive place for them? What do we need to do to give them time to deal with some of these issues? So we have a wellness day once a month on top of all of our holidays where we're closed. Um, so no one pinging you on Slack because you're not here mm -hmm. on vacation. No, everybody's gone. Um, so you can go to the dry cleaner. You can get your, your modem fixed. You can tell the neighbor down the street to stop their construction. <laughs> 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 you need to do, but you have a weekday to do it. 
Um, and I found that's been one of the best ways to support people is just give them a collective pause um, to deal with things and know that like work is going to wait. Yep. Yeah. Being able to, in IT, we, we work in an area where, hey, this is critical infrastructure. It's like power. It's like, it, it's like, I mean, phones are technology, but having, you know, it's walking into a room and having a roof leak. Well, suddenly this is now my day and that's the customer existence. But being able to take a, a step back and say, okay, this needs to not be such an emergency all the time. And we need to be able to take a collective pause so that people can it, it, let that stress cortisone level go down. And so for the folks that are on here, I want to I want to take a pause myself and say, like, we've just been talking quite a bit about process and culture and what Synchro is doing. Emily, do you mind cluing everyone in for those who might not be familiar or might only have a, a tangential understanding? Who is Synchro? What do you guys do? <laughs> Now we want to talk about that. Um, That's yeah. right. <laughs> so Synchro is um, a PSA, RMM, and remote access platform for managed service providers. In case you haven't heard of us at a very basic level, um, we are a remote company. Um, yes. We have over 4,000 partners um, using our platform every day. So we've grown quite quickly. Um, and we really are sort of the central uh, business operations for a managed service provider. Um, we pride ourselves in that. We, we um, partner with our customers to help their businesses uh, grow and to help them run more efficiently every day. And our mission is to make life better for MSPs. So we really are looking at ways to help improve their business process, but also talking about the whole person, help um, their business grow, um, help them have less stress in their day-to-day -day, um, and uh, a better sort of existence. So, yeah. That's and that's such a a key partnership indicator is having someone who comes to the table and says, "Hey, like, how can we how can we make this better? How can we do better?" And for everyone who who's watching this, if you look at this URL on your screen right now, if you hop over there, and if you are interested in becoming a Synchro partner, take a screenshot of this, come back, do a view on demand, just make sure that you save this because you came to the Thursday process. Talk to us about that twenty five there at the end of that at the end of that link there's a kind of a special offer that someone can take advantage of because they came and spent an hour with us what's that what's that 25 mean why don't you tell them Ian? <laughs> oh i don't want to i don't want to speak out of turn so i am uh, jennifer is uh thank you jennifer you uh you sent all that detail in here is this 20 duh, i don't want to say it I don't want to say it live. Well, maybe they should go to the URL and then they'll find out. <laughs> they have a wonderful marketing team. Um, yes. And if you're looking that up, the other way, um, you said people can reach 25% off their first year with Synchro. Thank you. Wow. That's what the 25 is. Are you, are you is. sure? Are you yes, 25% off for the first year. It's in writing on on okay. Synchro letterhead. Okay. If, if, Jennifer, if, if Jennifer said it, then you know, it's true. Right. So. I got to go with that. And also people can contact me anytime at CEO at SynchroMSP.com. So anyone who's on the call, even if you're not a partner and you just want to talk about remote workforce, I'm totally happy uh, to, to go back and forth or, or uh, you know, exchange notes on that. Even if you have a, a better suggestion for me, I'm always open to hear that too. Absolutely. CEO at SynchroMSP.com. And this is one of those, have some engagement, have, have the discussion, but this isn't a, you got to do this today, everyone, this offer that, and again, Jennifer's a, Jennifer's the key person here. It's up a good up until October 31st. So you've got all the way up until Halloween. So hop in, have that conversation and then go ahead and, and, uh, save some, save some space and save, uh, save a little bit of money on that first year of engagement. A reminder to everyone, there's that handout in the in the upper right-hand corner, the handouts item. You can download those handouts, but we always have a little bit of space here to have some conversation around questions and answers. And so for any of you who are, who are on, who might have been holding a question, if you want to ask that, don't worry. I'll go ahead and practice anonymous questions. I won't say your name, even though it'll say up. I, I won't say your name about uh about what's going on so you don't have to worry about uh being outed for your question go ahead and, and send it out um 
there is one that came in on the back end, and I'm just flipping over to it. So when we're um, when, when you're referring to different workforce, oh, where'd everyone go? When you're referring to <laughs> different different mediums of communication, Emily, have you found that there's one that seems to resonate more? Or is it just, is it, is it a coin flip? This is, this is a question that got emailed into me is, is yeah. there one medium that's better? So to speak. That, that sounds like someone who wants to prioritize. <laughs> mm. I wish, I wish it was that easy. Um, you know, I think it, it really comes down to different people perceive information in different ways. And after a certain amount of times hearing it, they kind of um, process it differently. So I'm not sure there's the one way or one time that you could be so efficient that you only have to do it this one way, this one time to get through to everybody. I think you can try to tailor it based on who you're talking to from experience. Maybe a certain team perceives things well, or after you get into a cadence, it bec you, you can have some shorthand or you, know, you don't have to invest as much to communicate. But um, I really think it's a very personal kind of reception uh, model for different folks. Um, I do know that having it written down or having it in a place where people can refer back to is important. So if you're doing all the communication in one-on-ones, right, mm -hmm. and it's not in a collective place where people can discuss it, see it, reflect on it, uh, that's probably not ideal. Uh, but yeah, so the more um, public and available and accessible it is, probably the better, no matter what the media, like no matter what the format of the information is. So creating that central repository, make it so that it can be accessed on demand. So if someone comes in and, and sees that live webcast from you talking about things, make sure it's recorded. Maybe they can go back, re-listen to it, think, consider, because everybody processes in their own way. We've got about a minute left here. I want to take a, a, a couple of seconds right here to thank everyone for joining us today. If you're interested in learning more about Synchro, you can go to their website, synchromsp.com. Richardson and Richardson's available at rr.consulting. And Emily, I wanna I wanna let you have the the final 30 second word, but before that, I just wanna say thank you for taking time out of your day and sh being willing to share your knowledge and the processes that Synchro has used to successfully do a, a remote workforce and embrace that strategy before, through, and kind of hopefully at the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but what's a final thought, a final takeaway? 20 seconds and then it's gonna kick us all out. Okay, well, I'm, you know, thank you for having me. Um, I hope that you know, some of the knowledge and learnings I've shared today help other folks. And like I said, I'm always interested to hear from other people. Um, if they have any suggestions that are working for them, uh, you can reach me at CEO at synchromsp.com. Perfect, thank you so much, Emily. And everyone until next time, Hey, take it easy.